Welcome, everybody. Uh, today is a pleasure to have Artur Nicolaou from Barcelona, and he will speak on a central lim limit theorem for iterates of an inner function. So, uh, thanks a lot. So, I'm going to share the screen. Okay, so I hope uh, you are uh, seeing this. <laughs> Let me first uh, thank uh, the organizers for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to talk here, and it has also been a pleasure to listen to others. Uh, so thanks for organizing the seminar, Marco, Filippo, and Nicola. So uh, well, my plan is to present a uh, joint work with uh, Odisole. So I have a picture of both here. Odi is, as you may imagine, the young one, the one with her. Uh, he's uh, now a postdoc in Augsburg in Germany. Okay. So and, and the plan is to talk about uh, central limit theorem for inner functions. So let me start with some uh, basic definitions. Okay. So D will be the unit disk here in the complex plane. And uh, this is the standard definition of an inner function. So an analytic mapping from the disk into itself is inner if it has radial limits of modulus one at almost every point in the circle, okay? So inner functions map uh, the disk into itself. and have this extremal property of, in some sense, mapping the circle into itself. So as uh, well, you know, uh, inner functions are uh, a central notion, both in complex and functional analysis, and they also show up in, in, in many other areas. So examples of inner functions, Probably the, the most uh, elementary examples are finite Blaschke products. So just uh, finite products of um, Mobius transformations uh, from the disk into itself. But there are also, as you know, infinite Blaschke products. So Blaschke products with infinitely many zeros. And there are also inner functions uh, which uh, do not have any zero in the unit disk. These are called the uh, singular inner functions. But if you are not used, uh, just uh, have uh, this example in mind. Just finally many uh, uh, finite Blaschke product. Okay? So we will be interested in uh, the behavior of the function in the boundary, so defined in the boundary. So here is, uh, you should think on this function as uh, defined only at almost every point in terms of the radial limits. And I should say that uh, this function, uh, I mean, the one in from the circle into itself is only defined at almost every point in the circle. And moreover, it could be actually this continues at every point in the circle. So it's far from being smooth. The iterates will be denoted uh, by f uh, to the power n. This would mean the nth iterate of uh, the function f. And m will stand for normalized Lebesgue measure in, in, in the unit circle, okay? So, well, the, the, the main message of the talk is that uh, these uh, iterates, in some sense, behave as independent random variables. And uh, actually, what we're going to do is, uh, 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 the plan is to present a uh, uh, central limit theorem for these iterates, right? So let me start recalling the central limit theorem. So uh, here is, uh, 
this is the content of uh, this screen. So let's uh, let XK be a sequence of independent, identically distributed random variables, which are centered and whose variance uh, is sigma square. Okay. Then, um, well, as you know, the central limit theorem tells that when conveniently, conveniently normalized, the sums uh, converge in distribution to a, a normal uh, to a normal random variable. Okay, so this means uh, this means this this uh, expression means that you have a point match convergence, if you want, of the distribution functions. So this means that for any k here is going to be an interval. So for any interval k in the real line, uh, the probability of this event, the, the normalized sum uh, are in a given interval, tends when n tends to infinity to the Gaussian measure of the interval. Okay? So, uh, well, I, I wanted to, to state the, the, this classical result just to, um, to recall that here we have two main assumptions. One is independence, uh, the, and the other is that the variables are identically distributed. Of course, this central limit theorem has been extended in many different directions. Okay, but in some sense, these uh, these two assumptions are always more or less present in some sense. Okay, so in in our setting, uh, we will be studying inner functions. So we will be in in a context where independence is not directly present. But even if it is not directly present, uh, uh, some of the um, peculiar things of independence uh, can still be used. So this already happens uh, in, in other contexts in geometric function theory. And uh, actually our results are inspired by uh, old results by Salem and Zygmunt on lacunary series. So let me start recalling these results. So here is uh, uh, the definition of a lacunary series. So a lacunary series is a power series where only a few powers are present and the powers which are present correspond to indexes which uh, grow exponentially fast, okay? So for instance, Typical example would be nk to be 2 to the k. So in that case, only uh, in that case, Lacunary series with these uh, powers would be a series of this form, right? Okay. So, and again, uh, what happens is that uh, say the philosophy, if you want, is that there's this, uh, if you have a lacunary sequence, these lacunary powers behave as independent random variables. And, in, and I guess it makes a lot of sense, right? Because the idea is that since the powers uh, which are present, this NK uh, grow exponentially fast, even if you have some information on how uh, is z to the power n sub k, not too much can be said about z to the power n sub k plus one, just because n sub k plus one is much more bigger than n sub k, okay? So this uh, is, uh, well, uh, what is, uh, I guess, behind uh, some of the results I used. Arthur, I think I lost your. Yeah, we cannot hear you. Uh, we lost. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Wait. I'm sorry. We lost your the audio, but the just audio uh, lost? yeah, but just uh, the very last minute, I, I immediately okay. stopped. So now, now can can you hear me now? 
Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, I was talking about the uh, lacunary series, okay? Right, the, the, com the convergence. Oh, yeah, okay. So, um, so I, now I, was, I wanted to state uh, this result by Pale and Zygmunt, which is on point based convergence of a lacunary series. And uh, it says that the result is the following. The following three statements are equivalent. Uh, the series converges at almost every point in the unit circle. Or the second statement is that the lacunary series converges at a set of points of positive Lebesgue measure on the unit circle. And the third statement, uh, the third equivalent statement is that the coefficients uh, are square summable. Okay. So if you want, uh, in maybe you can restate that in the following way, right? Either these the coefficients are the square summable, and in that case, the series converges at almost every point. Or the series diverges, the coefficients are not square summable, and then the series, the lacunary series diverges at almost every point. So it's like a zero one law, right? Either you have convergence at almost every point or you have divergence at almost every point. Okay. So what Zaleman Singmon did was the following. Uh, let's uh, let's assume we are in this situation. So let's assume that uh, the sequence uh, of coefficients is not a square summable. Then uh, you may ask, well, even if uh, the lacunary series diverges at almost every point, how this uh, how the partial sums distribute their values? Okay. So how is the distribution of the values? And this is, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the result uh, is a version of the central limit theorem for lacunary series. And here is the result, okay? So assume that the sequence of coefficients are not a square summable. Then, as I said, uh, the lacunary series diverges at almost every point. And let's uh, and, and consider sigma sub n, to be the partial sum of uh, the coefficients. So this is look something like the variance. So this is something, this is just, if you want, just right? This is just the L2 norm, okay? So, uh, what Zalem and Zygmunt did was, was the following. Assume, assume that the uh, AN is uh, negligible uh, in, uh, compared to sigma N. So this means that assume that in, in, in the expression given by sigma N, uh, a single A coefficient is really not important. Then what happens is the conclusion is that the, the partial sums, when conveniently normalized again, uh, so these partial sums conveniently normalized distribute their values according to a complex uh, normal variable. Okay, and this means uh, now we are in in the in, in a complex valued case. So this means uh, what I have written here, right? That the measure of the set of points were this uh, normalized uh, partial sum is in a given k here is going to be a disk. So for any disk k, uh, when you look to the measure of points in the circle where these uh, partial sums uh, are in k, when n tends to infinity, this tends to the uh, Gaussian measure of the disk k. Okay. So, so this was, as I said, the, the inspiration of our research, and we really like uh, this uh, result a lot. 
and probably, I guess, Salem and Zygmunt also like it uh, a lot because they proved uh, many different variants of uh, the same result. For instance, they proved the uh, variants of the result for uh, Fourier series, also for Walsh series. And let me mention that they proved also, in the context of lacunary series, they proved also uh, a ver local versions of it. So. What, the, what does this mean? So uh, a local version means the following. It's like a central limit theorem, but uh, not only on the whole unit circle, but also uh, uh, in if you focus on a set of positive measure, here you also have a central limit theorem. So this means the following. So fix a set E in the circle of positive measure, okay? Then uh, what they prove is that under the same assumptions, the conclusion is that if you look, instead of looking to the measure of the set of points in the whole circle, you restrict attention to E and you normalize, this still tends to improbability to, in distribution to a complex normal Gaussian. So this still holds, right? So it's not only uh, that the central limit theorem holds in the unit circle, but also it also holds in any uh, measurable subset of the unit circle, okay? So this is a variant they proved. Another variant they proved is uh, what we call a tail serial T, so a tail central limit theorem. So let me explain what uh, this tail CLT is. So uh, assume now that uh, instead of uh, instead of um, uh, having uh, coefficients which are not square summable, assume now that the coefficients are square summable, so that the sum the sum is finite. Okay. Then of course the series the lacunar series converges at almost every point. This was the previous result by Pali and Zim. but happens is that the natural answer, the natural question is, well, even if uh, the series uh, converges at almost every point, how do the tails behave? So the tails of this uh, series, how do they distribute their values? And again, there is a central limit theorem here. So if I call sigma n star the tail of this, uh, of this uh, L2 expression, then the conclusion, instead of this conclusion, what you would get is that the sum from K, what? The sum for K bigger than N of AK Z to the NK divided by now is, uh, it's like the variance of, of, of the future, say. This tends in distribution to a, a complex Gaussian again, right? Meaning precisely the same thing, okay? So, but in that case, you are looking at the tails. Okay, so even if you have a convergence, the tails distribute their values according to a, to a normal distribution. Okay, so this is the, the, the central limit theorem for, for lacunary series. And now let me return to, to inner functions. And maybe the first thing I should mention is that, um, well, the dynamics of an inner function is inside the unit disk is governed by, by uh, this classical result by the Injua and Wolf. So, uh, so let me recall that. So if you have an inner function, which uh, fixes the origin and which is not a rotation, then the heat rates uh, tend to zero uniformly on complex of the unit disk. So in other words, uh, the origin acts as an attractive fixed point inside the unit disk. Um, this is very nice and actually we use this result, uh, but um, the, the, what we are interested in is in, in the behavior of the mapping, uh, the inner function mapping the circle into itself. So the boundary mapping, okay? And let me say that uh, 
we have also, I mean, this has also been studied. So, for instance, it is well known that the, when you have a linear function which fixes the origin, this is an ergodic transformation, it's even mixing. And in particular, you can uh, apply the ergodic theorem. And using the, ergo, I mean, the ergodic theorem would tell you that uh, the, the means, right, this uh, temp, this, um, Time means, say, converge to the spatial means. And of course, since f of zero is equal to zero, this converges to zero, okay? So this is true. So this means that for almost every point, when you look to the orbit of almost every point, the orbit, the orbits uh, well distributed are in a sense well distributed, right? Because when you take the mean of the orbit, you uh, tend to zero. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, since we are going to, I'm sorry, since we are going to discuss a central theorem in theorem for linear functions, I guess it's natural to start uh, discussing the two main uh, assumptions in a central limit theorem, right? that is independence and uh, identical distribution. Okay. So, so we have uh, here uh, uh, a good news and a bad news, uh, some good news and some bad news. So let me start with um, bad news. Okay. So assume that you have an inner function, uh, which is not a rotation and fixed in the origin. Recall that Fn is just the nth iterate of F. And well, the first thing is, well, I, I, I understand it as a bad new, right? Because, of course, the iterates are not independent. It could not be independent in any sense. Actually, I cannot imagine anything more dependent than the sequence of iterates, right? The n plus one iterate depends completely on the nth iterate, okay? So, well, these uh, are very far from being independent. So this is uh, a at uh, new, but here is a good new. The good new is that the iterates uh, have uh, identical distribution. And this is actually a, a classical result, uh, which is known as left. Okay, so assume that you have an inner function fixed in the origin. Here it is. And assume that you have a set E right, in the unit circle. Then you look uh, to the pre-image, and of course the pre-image could be very complicated uh, uh, from the topological point of view, because the mapping is, the mapping F uh, in the boundary could be highly discontinuous. So the pre-image is probably, well, very complicated, but still uh, Lebesgue measure is invariant. So this means that the length of the pre-image is equal to the length of the set. This is actually uh, classical, as I said, and not very and very easy to prove. But instead of uh, proving it, uh, I have uh, decided to just to present an example, just to convince you. Okay. So the example is very easy. It's just uh, a, a concrete inner function, so z to the power n. Okay. So let's look to this inner function. Here we have a set E which could be an arc of length delta. Then, of course, the pre-image uh, would be just uh, n tiny arcs centered at the end roots of uh, the set uh, 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 of the unity. And each tiny arc has length delta divided by n, right? So, uh, the sum of the lengths of these lengths is delta divided by n times n, so it's like delta, okay? So uh, this is what uh, Lefner's lemma tells. Okay, another way of uh, stating Lefner's lemma is uh, this uh, one you have here in terms of integrals. So it says that whenever uh, you're integrating, uh, you know, when your function is a composition with f, you can forget about the f, okay? And this is clear, right? Because in order to show this for any uh, integrable function, you can always assume that g is the characteristic function of a set, 
because by linearity, if you prove it for characteristic functions, uh, you are done. And of course, for the characteristic function of a set, uh, this expression here is just the length, the measure of the, the set E, and this would be just the measure of the preimage. Okay. So for characteristic functions, this statement is precisely Lesner's lemma. But I wanted to mention that because this uh, Lesner's lemma uh, gives us a way of computing the variance. So uh, let's. Uh, go to the next uh, to the next um, screen and let's let me this is just uh, uh, Lefner's lemma and uh, let me just uh, uh, compute this integral here right the, the, the integral you have here so it's, uh, you have an inner function fixed in the origin, and then you have two indexes, one bigger than the other, and you want to compute this integral. But of course, uh, you can say if you want, decompose it uh, with f, right? So each time you have f, the f, uh, you, can you can apply this, uh, you can apply this, um, this identity, and then you arrive to this integral. And in this integral, uh, you can apply uh, Cauchy's formula. So this is just the derivative of this function at the origin. But of course, um, the origin is a fixed point. So you apply the chain rule and you arrive that this is equal to this, okay? So this means that uh, these integrals can be easily computed in terms of the derivative of the function at the origin. So this allows us, as I said, to, uh, to compute uh, the, the variance. So this would be the variance, right? The or if you want the L2 normal, okay? So how do we compute that? So we just uh, do the, well, the most, um, the most uh, elementary thing, which is expand this uh, this this modulus square. So if we expand this modulus square, what we'll get is just a n square f n square, and then two times the real part of this expression, right? A n bar k bigger than n. AK, FK, FM bar, just expanding uh, this modulus square. And then, uh, of course, you, you, you have to remember that the function F is inner, right? Since it's inner, this term here, this is just of modulus one, so this you can forget. And when you take the integrals, uh, you have uh, first this term, this term here, and then you have uh, the you have to integrate th these guys, but this is precisely what we computed uh, in, in in the previous line, and then you arrive to this expression here. Okay. So in other in other uh, words, the variance has two terms: one which is the sum of the modulus square, oh, sorry, and the other which is this mixed product, this mixed term. Okay. And it's uh, not hard to, to see that this mixed term actually can be absorbed by uh, the first one. So uh, I'm not going to explain that, but it's not hard to show this. Okay? So in this way, we can uh, we can we can um, compute the variance. And actually, uh, this argument also shows that uh, the sequence of iterates. The linear combination of the iterates converges in L2, even only if the sum of the coefficients of square is finite. So, and it's also true that this holds even only if this sum converges point-wise at almost every point. This is also true, but I'm not going to, to, to present uh, this proof, but uh, let me just say that this is also true. So it's very similar to the situation in, for lacunary series. 
pointwise convergence uh, is given by uh, when is, is uh, holds the pointwise convergence holds when the coefficients are square sum of all. So now I can uh, state our main result, which is this uh, uh, central limit theorem for iterates of an inner function. So here I have uh, here I have just uh, copied uh, the the previous computation. So this is the variance. Okay, this will be the sigma n squared, and here is our result. Assume that you have an inner function which fixed the origin and which is not a rotation. Assume that you have um, coefficients which are bounded and which are not a square summable. So again, this means that uh, this sum here does not converge point-wise uh, at almost every point. So you can then ask, well, how this sum shows how a linear combination of fit rates of a linear function distributes their values. And it turns out that they distribute their values according to a complex normal Gaussian. Okay? Of course, when, again, nor conveniently normalized. Okay? And the normalization is given by this sigma n square. Okay? So this is the, the main result. And now I'd like to, I would like to, to, to to mention a few remarks. Well, the first thing is that in contrast with the result of Salim and Zygmunt, in our result, no lacunarity assumption is needed. So uh, here we have the whole sequence of iterates, right? If instead of having the whole sequence of iterates, we would have only a lacunary sequence of iterates, the result would be, I mean, the proof would be much more easy. So part of the difficulty is that we want to deal here with the whole sequence of iterates, which is, I guess, the natural, the natural result. The second thing I wanted to say is that uh, we also have a tail central limit theorem. So in the same esprit uh, than the tail central limit theorem of Salem and Zygmunt. So if instead of assuming that the sum, the coefficients are not a square summable, you assume that the coefficients are the square summable, then what happens is that the lacunary series, I'm, I'm sorry, what happens then is that T series converges at almost every point. But then you can ask, well, how do the tails distribute their values? And again, they, uh, the tails distribute their values according to a complex normal Gaussian. Okay? So I'm not going to state uh, the result, but, uh, but I guess uh, you understand the idea. This next thing I wanted to say is that, uh, well, that we do not have a local version. So re uh, remember that uh, uh, for lacunary series, Salim and Zygmunt proved a central limit theorem even in any uh, fixed uh, measurable set in the unit circle. So it would be natural in our situation also to prove this, right? That if you fixed a set in the unit circle, it's, it would be very natural to prove this. And this, uh, well, our proof does not give that. Okay? So this is, um, I, I wanted to mention this because um, because I, I, want, I want to say that our, as you will see, our methods are of um, complex analysis nature. So we really use that certain integrals vanish. And so we use a certain cancellations which occur on the whole unit circle. If we are in a given set in the unit circle, uh, we, do not, we do not know how, how to argue. Okay. And last thing I wanted to show, wanted to say is, well, that there are some cases where, which I should uh, mention. So for instance, if uh, the function f, uh, the derivative of the function f vanishes at the origin. So if f prime of zero is equal to zero. In that case, of course, the variance is much more easy. This disappears and this is just the alpha norm of the coefficients, right? Another thing I wanted to say is that what happens if all the coefficients are one, okay? Well, of course, if all the coefficients are one, 
then and this sum is just the sum of the iterates, right? So it's like an ergodic sum. And this is, of course, a relevant uh, situation. And it's very nice that when all the coefficients are one, then, of course, this is like, this is just n, and this is just n minus k. So this means that this is like a geometric series you can sum. So everything is explicit. And what happens is that this sigma n squared is just n times sigma squared. And this sigma squared has this, uh, well, believe me, right? I'm not going to do the calculations, but it's just a, a direct calculation. And this sigma squared has this nice uh, uh, expression, right? This uh, depends only on the derivative at the origin. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Because if the derivative of the origin is very close to one, this means that the function is very close to be the identity. And on the other hand, you have a lot of dispersion, right? This is what you probably would expect. Okay, so now, um, well, the, the rest of the talk is devoted to, to, to mention a few ideas in, in the proof. And well, the, there are, I guess, two main ingredients in the proof. And this is explained in, in, in the following um, in the screen. And both uh, results I wanted to mention, in some sense, I guess, reflect uh, the degree of independence of the sequence of iterates of an inner function. Well, so let, 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 me, let me explain that. Okay, so assume that you have a, a, a subset of positive integers, and let's, uh, we are going to use this notation, sigma sub a, psi, I'm sorry, psi sub a is going to be the, psi, such sub a is going to be uh, the partial sum corresponding to the indexes in A, okay? So the first uh, theorem says the following. It says that uh, assume that you have two set of indexes, A and B, and uh, assume that the, the, the indexes in A are smaller than the indexes in B, okay? So we are in this situation. Then the result says that the integral of the product is the product of the integrals, right? So, of course, uh, well, we write, we like uh, this result a lot, right? It's like, uh, well, it's very nice, right? Uh, and of course, this result would hold if these two functions of these two variables as, as random variables, if these two random variables are in, were independent, but they are not independent, right? They are not independent because they both depend on, 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 on the iterates of the same inner function. So they are far from being independent, but still uh, there is a kind of, uh, well, there are certain cancellations which occur uh, in such a way that the result holds, okay? So this is the first uh, result I want to discuss. And the second result uh, we really use uh, is uh, this uh, second theorem. So if for this second theorem, let me use this notation. So if n is a positive integer, uh, let me denote by f minus n, the complex conjugate of the nth iterate of the function. Okay? So uh, a negative power means that we are taking conjugates. So the second theorem says the following, assume that uh, you want to compute uh, the integral over the whole unit circle of products of iterates. But here the epsilons could be pluses or minus. So this means that we are uh, taking products of iterates or complex conjugates of iterates, okay? So this is something like a higher order correlations, right? Because we are uh, integrating products or uh, of iterates or complex conjugates. And so this gives you uh, an estimate on these high order correlations. So remember that since F is an inner function fixed in the origin, it's Bar's lemma, which is not a rotation, F Bar's lemma says that F prime of zero is a smaller than one. And we are going to apply this theorem when both Q and K are very large. But say that Q is going to be much more larger than K. Q 
is uh, the distance between one uh, iterate and the next and the next one. So this gives uh, this estimate uh, when Q is much more larger than K, this gives you a sort of an exponential decay. And this is really what is needed in the central Leon limit theorem, an exponential decay of higher order correlations. So this is this will be also used uh, in, in 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 our proof. So let me say that uh, these two, the proof of these two results, use a common tool, and the tool is Alexandrov Clark measures for for inner functions. So let me recall that for you. So assume that you have a, an analytic mapping from the disk into itself could be an inner function. And then you compose it with, uh, with this uh, Mobius transformation, with this homography, which maps the unit disk into the right half plane, okay? So this means that this composition has positive real power. Uh, since this is an analytic mapping, having positive real part can be written as the Herglot's integral of a positive measure. So here mu alpha is a positive measure on the unit circle. This positive measure is called uh, Alexandrov-Clark measure of the function f at the point alpha. And these measures were introduced by Clark in the 70s in relation to problems with opera uh, of operator theory but uh, their, main, their main properties uh, were well discovered by uh, Clark himself and uh, by Ahern, um, Sarason, and Paul Toraski and Alexandrov and many others. Okay? And it's a very well nice tool. Well, let me mention uh, a couple of uh, actually easy properties. The one is that the function you start with uh, is inner so it maps the circle into its if and only if the measure mu alpha is singular with respect to Lebesgue measure. And actually, uh, in that case, the measure is concentrated in the places where f is equal to alpha. So it's something like that, that uh, you have your inner function You have your point alpha. You look to the preimage. The preimage of the point alpha is going to be of Lebesgue measure zero, so it's a small preimage. And here is in this preimage where the mu alpha is concentrated. Of course, if you change uh, and you look to another point beta, then the preimage is going to be different. Yeah, it's given by these pink uh, points now. And here you will have the measure mu sub beta. So this means that mu alpha and mu beta are concentrated in uh, in different uh, cells. Okay. The nice thing is that so so you have for any alpha in the circle you have your the measure mu alpha. So it's very natural to ask well what happens when you average all these uh, singular measures. And here is Alexander of this integration theorem, which is uh, he, he gives uh, the answer. So it 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 happens that when you average all these uh, singular measures with respect to Lebesgue measure, you recover Lebesgue measure. So in other words, if you want to integrate a function against Lebesgue measure in the unit circle, what you can do is you integrate against one uh, Alexander of Clark measure. You compute uh, the integral with respect to Alexander of Clark measure, and then you average with respect to this uh, angle alpha. Okay. So this. Uh, so let me let me try to explain how this result is used. Okay. So for instance, um, let me just. Uh, I want to share with you the flavor of the the argument. So this will was the first uh, result I wanted to mention, that uh, the integral of the product is the product of the integrals, right? And the functions are the modulus square of the partial sums. So how do we prove this? So the way, the way we prove this is, well, but 
by we, we just expand, right? So this we expand it as a psi sub a is just a partial sum. So we expand the partial sum, and we do the same with the psi sub b squared. We expand the partial sum. So the first time we tried that, we we thought that this was hopeless because it, it's a, well, it's it's a mess, right? You what you get is linear combinations of things of this sort. Okay. Then in order to prove the result, what you need to show is that the integral of this product is the product of the integrals, okay? But these two guys, we already computed. This was, this was computed in, in the previous screen. It was the derivative at the point at the origin with power j minus n. And this was the derivative at the origin of the power l minus k. So this was already computed. So this is what we need to show. Okay. We need to show that the integral of these four of the product of these four iterates is equal to that. So, so let's start. What we do is the following. First, we use that whenever you have everything depends on on the nth iterate. So we use that dm is invariant. So recall that whenever you have something with the, which is composed with f, you can decompose of it. So uh, you arrive to this uh, integral of four products of the, this one here. And now here is the point. The point, and you'll see how these Alexander Clark measures uh, help. So this is just the integral of v mu alpha, dm alpha. This is Alexander of the integration theorem. Okay, so this means that uh, instead of this dm, we can write it that way, okay? But observe that mu alpha is concentrated in the places where this function is equal to alpha. It's concentrated here. So instead of this term, I can write alpha. And instead of this, I can write these other two, okay? So this means that the only thing we need to to compute is this moment. The moment of the Alexander of Clark measure uh, with respect to the variable Z. And this is very easy, right? Because this was the definition of the Alexander of Clark measures and expanding both terms, you can easily show, this is a really uh, a very easy calculation. You can easily show that this moment is given by this uh, quantity. And this is very nice because here, uh, you, you'll see here that uh, the cancellation occurs, right? Because you have here alpha bar and here you have alpha and alpha bar times alpha is mod alpha square, which is one because you are in the unit circle. So this means that uh, you, what you get here is just a constant, which is this one, right? And the other is precisely what you wanted, right? This was F prime of zero to the power L minus K. So this is uh, the end of, of, this, uh, of the proof of this first uh, identity. So as you see, uh, this really depends on complex analysis. Okay? In part, uh, well, uh, cancellation of certain intervals. So the last, I guess, do I have still five minutes? Yes, you do. Yes. Yeah. You know, you know. Okay, so let let me finish just uh, mentioning uh, well something more technical about the proof. Just again because I wanted to 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 I wanted to share the flavor of the proof. So what we do is the following: um, we start. I mean, the proof is divided into several steps. The first step, uh, what we do is to split the partial sum into pieces, into blocks. Okay, and uh, so. Sigma n was the the variance, which was uh, what was the variance, which was comparable to the uh, L two norm of the coefficients. And what we do is we just this tends to infinity, right? Because this was part of the assumption, right? That the the, the coefficients were not a square summable. And what we do is we factor this into two parts. One, which is well, both parts are large. P u n and q n are large because Sn tends to infinity, but this is of course larger, right? Because epsilon here is going to be a fixed positive number. 
and this is going to be smaller, right? So in, and what we, what we do is the following. We split the partial sum into blocks. The blocks are, we have the, say the long blocks, because they have large uh, L2 norm and the short blocks, because they have a small block norm, a small L2 norm. And the next nice thing, I mean, in this way, we, we accomplish uh, two things. The first is that the short blocks are irrelevant because they have a small L2 norm. So since they have a small L2 norm, they are, they are not going to play any role. The action occurs with the long blocks, the ones uh, which have large uh, L2 norm. But the thing that between two large blocks, there is a, a short block uh, provides a, a certain degree of independence between these long blocks. Okay, and this will be used in a minute. Okay, so these are this is the first step. So in the first step, uh, as a conclusion, we can forget about the short blocks, and we are on, only going to deal with the long blocks. And for the long blocks, what we do is we act uh, in the traditional way. In order to prove a central limit theorem, what you apply is this Levy continuity theorem, and you want to show that the Fourier transform tends to a Gaussian. Okay, so here we apply, uh, as I said, uh, the traditional scheme, and this is precisely what we want to show, right? So we want to show this. And this is, this should be called for any, for any complex number t. But of course, Tn is just a sum, so you have the exponential of a sum, so it's the product of the exponentials. And now uh, we use this, uh, this uh, asymptotic uh, expansion, which is very typical in central limit theorem. So this will be our number Z, will be this. And then if we forget about, about this small o, this requires some arguments, which I will skip, then uh, you arrive to an expression of this sort, okay? And now, uh, what, well, what you want to show is that this tends to you want to show that this tends to this exponential, okay? So what we want to show is that this tends to this exponential, point-wise. So we want to show this. And here is uh, the argument, okay? In order to show this, what we do is the following. We split this into two parts. This part, this big product, is going to be the function fn. I already have written it here, right? Uh, this is the function fn. And in order to show this, uh, believe me that we only need to show these three things, okay? And well, once we show a, b, and c, the rest is easy. So let's uh, uh, focus on a, b, and c. Well, first thing is that a, tells that this uh, exponent tends to t squared, mod t squared divided by two in L2. So this is a function, right? So we want to show that we have convergence in L2. Of course, in order to show that we have convergence in L2, we take the difference and we have to take in the square. So this means that we need to compute the L4 norms of the size. And again, these L4 norms are computed using Alexandrov Clark measures. So Alexandrov Clark measures are used again here. This is the first step. Second step is we want to show in order to finish the proof, we need to show in the second step that the L2 norm of the FNs are uniformly bounded. Well, this is uh, where, well, let me discuss this for a minute. So we, we, we need to, to compute the L2 norm of Fn, so this means that we take modulus square. So this is already purely imaginary. So this is modulus square. So we want to compute these integrals. And now we use Cauchy's bars, and instead of this uh, scalar product, we take uh, we use Cauchy's bars, and we have the modulus square. And this is very nice because what we do now is we expand this product. This product here we spanned. 
And when we expand this product, we arrive to expressions of this sort. Right? Products of modulus of psi j squared. And where here is where the first theorem applies. Because this is just the integral. This was this uh, identity, right? That the integral of the product was the product of the integrals. So this is where this is used. And finally, uh, the, the most uh, delicate part is to prove C. I'm sorry, to prove this part C here, right? So in this part C, we need to show that the integral of the, the integral of the Fn's 10 to one, okay? And here is the Fn. So again, what we do is something that, that well, uh, uh, when we start trying that, we thought that it was hopeless, but it worked at the end, okay? With some pain, but it worked. Because uh, Fn is this expression. So what we did is we, we just expand the, we just ex decided to expand this expression. So this, this is very nice because when you expand this expression, of course, you have one term, which is very easy, which is one times one times one times one. So this gives you one, but then you have all the other terms, okay? And you want to show that the integral uh, tends to one. So this means that you need to show that the integral of these guys tend to zero in a fast way, because at the end, you, you also would need to sum all of this, right? And this is where the second theorem uh, I explained uh, plays a role. Because when you expand uh, this uh, product here, you arrive to products of the size. And products of the size means products of iterates of the function f. And this is where this exponential decay of the higher order correlations plays a role. OK, so I guess this, that was all I wanted to say. Uh, thanks a lot for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, I'd like to ask if there are uh, questions, comments. So I have, uh, um, yeah, Arthur, are you there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I cannot see you anymore, but. Oh, oh wait a minute. Uh... Yeah. I'm sorry. So I, um, I'm wondering whether, uh, uh, I mean, if, you, if your inner function is uh, uh, a fixed point for radial limit, of course, on the boundary. Okay. Uh, so how this uh, if and how this enters into, into the picture? Yeah, so uh, yeah, that, that uh, we also ask ourselves that. Um, and the answer is uh, we don't know. Actually, um, if uh, if the the Joao wall fixed point is 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 in the boundary, um, you, our impression is that we would not we would not expect a, a central limit theorem in that in that case, at least in in, in this generality, because uh, it could happen that uh, this it could even happen that this. Uh, the jaw wall fixed point in the boundary would attract all the other points, right? So you would have uh, something which would be attracting. And in that case, uh, well, you would not expect this uh, uniform distribution given, given by the central limit theorem. So I guess that in general for inner functions, uh, having the jaw wall uh, fixed point in the boundary, no central limit theorem will be available, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Well, I have a very heuristic one or very vague, right? As a matter of fact, can, can you restate, or have you ever thought about you, you restating your theorem in terms of uh, the branch of object norms? Uh, no. Mm. Uh, no, no. Mm. 
No, so you you mean that there should be a certain relation between? Uh, this I, I don't know. And... I, I don't know. As a matter of fact, I mean, but I'm, I'm when I think of inner functions, uh, I think of the the branch Ravian spaces and uh, mm -hmm. and and I I don't know. I thought maybe there they could be some sort of a, a stability theorem for their norms or. Oh. Um, yeah, um, I, I, one thing. Uh, okay, so the, the the answer is again. I'm sorry. <laughs> the answer is again. I don't know, but uh, let me say something. Uh, at least we thought um, um, we did not uh, explore too much, uh, which is the following. Um, um, so you, when you have the inner function, you can look to the corresponding uh, uh, model space, right? This uh, say. K theta, right? K I, right. I'd say. In a, in At a, least in the meromorphic case. Yeah, yeah. Say, for instance, in the meromorphic oh. case. So, um, of course, when you look to the iterates, uh, each iterate hmm. is uh, is. I mean, f n is at the end uh, um, a factor of f n minus one. So this means that uh, the sequence of model spaces corresponding to iterates of a given inner function is probably uh, a sequence of the spaces which are um, nested, right? Yeah. And we were expecting, um, well, some relations, well, well, this is the end. What <laughs> I mean, we did not explore my, more, but we were expecting uh, some relation with, uh, some relations with uh, the projections of uh, one model space to the next one, but we did not really explore that. Yeah. yeah, that more or less what I had in mind. I don't, uh, I don't know if there okay. is uh, some interpretation in that sense. But. Uh, are are there any other questions? If not, we thank you, Arthur, again.